And uh, we are very privileged to have the man of God. And the next person you see after this video introduction is Dr. Francis Miles. What actually happens in the realm of the spirit where judgments are rendered concerning the destinies of men and the destinies of nations. If you know how to enter this realm, Daniel, you can move a whole lot of things in Babylon than you're moving now. Are you catching what I'm saying? And so Daniel's eyes are open and he sees what he's never seen before. The Ancient of Days is seated. Now notice that the language of this court is the language of earthly courts, meaning that God's court is not a copycat of, of the courts of men. The courts of men are a copycat of what's in heaven. Are you hearing what I'm saying? By faith, we understand that the world we live in was made by the word of God so that that which is seen comes out of what is not seen. So when I see a courtroom on earth, there's got to be a courtroom in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for an unusual supernatural encounter and divine downloads as we welcome for the first time in ICGC Open Heavens Temple, the Senior Pastor of Royal Priesthood International Church, Dr. Francis Miles. We are glad to host you, sir. Hallelujah. The media team doctor is so amazing. They look me better. In, they make me look better on video than I look on, in real life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you ready for another night of the God encounter? I said, are you ready for another night of the God encounter? Turn to the one next to you, two or three people, and tell them, neighbor, every altar in your life must, every evil altar in your life it tonight must bow. Tell them every evil altar in your life must bow tonight. Mm. Amen. I, 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 want us, uh, um, I want us to, while you're standing, like, I think, thank you so much. Remember that I want to start with standing for the, before the word of God. Again, I welcome, let's put our hands together for everybody on Facebook. I see a lot of people on Facebook. I'm sending it out, so we got a lot of people. Amen. Thank God. Amen. The devil overplayed his hands during the coronavirus, and he forced the church to fully understand we can do a lot of miracles teaching in the clouds because Jesus on the clouds. Come on, somebody. Before, the, before, before I, Apple and uh, Microsoft di discovered cloud technology, Jesus was the first man to be resurrected in the clouds. Hallelujah. Amen. So we thank God for that. Uh, media team, uh, I, I want to start with two scriptures that I know you are ready for. So give me Daniel chapter 7, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 25 to 27 uh, in the Amplified because I want to show the church something. Yeah, I just want, God told me this morning, last night and this morning when I was praying, he said, I want you it was, uh, to, to, uh, to sprinkle a little bit just to tie up what you said last night because then we're going to move into what I have for you today. I'm going to be talking about how to prosecute, how to prosecute evil altars in your bloodline, in your life and bloodline from the courts of heaven. That is going, what you're going to do. I'm expecting a lot of healing miracles because every time I do this particular teaching, there's a lot of healing miracles. Why? There are people whose, in, whose infirmity is connected to an altar. When the altar is destroyed, we're seeing people getting healed. Even to the point where we have one service, Dr. Eric in Zambia, we had 40 people who had tumors, tumors, some of the tumors disappear. 40 people in one service. Tumors, I'm talking about tumors in the body, in the feet, in the, I mean, it was amazing. One woman in America, a tumor this was a, like a golf ball after I taught on altars. And, uh, and, I'm gonna, and, and we, we began to, we went in the court of heaven and prosecuted these devils and these evil infrastructures and began to pray for people. She was scheduled for a brain surgery the very following day, a complicated one at that. The whole family was extremely worried because anytime you operate on the brain, it can go 50 50. 
You can get healed but lose your speech. You, whatever. So many things have happened. They were terrified. When they went the following day after my service to try to do the surgery, the doctor came out and said, the neuro doctor came back and said, said to her, listen, there is no surgery today. He says, why? Are you not ready? He says, no, because there is no tumor anymore in your brain. We can't find it. Amen. Are you cut? Can I just say by the lifting of your hands, anybody tonight that needs a healing from Jesus, raise your hand, please. I want to see you. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Amen. I mean, I see those hands. So I, I, I just prophesy. That's what our conference is. I prophesy that when you leave this place, you'll be fully healed. Amen. Come on. You'll be fully healed. Amen. So let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Because the Lord said to me, there's a, there's the, the, he said to me, there's a few people who are fully not uh, convinced about the courts of heaven. And I don't know why he said that, but he, when he says that, there is reason for it. And he said to me, give, me the, give them these two scriptures, and it's going to nail this thing in the head so they can fully understand this is part of your inheritance. And you do well to quickly understand it and begin to operate in it. Because the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Just because you don't know about the court of heaven doesn't mean the enemy cannot use that ignorance to delay or hinder your destiny. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 to 27. I'm going to I'll count up to three, and since it's on the board, I'm going to ask everybody as loud as you can if you could read it with me. Amen? From verse 25 to 27, one, two, three, read. He will speak words against the Most High God and wear down the saints of the Most High. He will intend to change the times and the law, and they will be given to him for a time, two times, and half a time. Three, one, three and one half years. Verse 26, but the court of the Most High will sit in judgment and his dominion will be taken away, first to be consumed gradually and then to be destroyed forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints, believers of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord for the reading of God's word, and may you, you, may get, you may take your seats. I want you to notice how powerful the coach of heaven is. Because tonight when we deal with evil altars, this is where we're going to take them. And the reason there is, we are seeing massive breakthroughs around the world when we do this teaching is because of the authority, the, uh, the authority of the court of heaven. Please notice that in, if you read that particular uh, Daniel chapter 7 in proper context, it is talking about the coming of the Antichrist. And we know that we are living in the time, all the signs are leading to the coming of the man of sin. Is that right? You know, and then watch this what he says. He says, for a time, the saints will, he will, he will wear out the saints. They will be given to him for a time. But check this out. But notice that when the Antichrist is operating on the earth, I want you to notice the Bible tells us how he loses authority on the earth. He loses authority and dominion on the earth after the saints have been placed under serious persecution. They have been, uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, I mean, in other words, he, everything turns in his ability to dominate the planet by one thing only. It is not by the praying of the saints, even though I, I believe praying of the saints and the, our cry and the cries of the saints who are living in that time will be part of it. But the main reason why the Antichrist and his dominion was removed is because the court of heaven sat and elicited judgment against him. So even the Antichrist is not above the court of heaven. So if the Antichrist, the man of sin, is not above the court of heaven, do you think the altars you are dealing with are up above the court of heaven? The devil is a liar. You think the witchcraft that's coming against you every night is above the court of heaven? I've had people, perennial witchcraft. I mean, it, it's like witchcraft living in the next, it's like some of you, some Christians, they love the Lord, but you know, witches visit them every day. Talk to me, somebody. Ah, they wake up every morning. Ah, it was somebody was choking me. The day of you being choked is coming to an end. Over. You know, and we took them in the court of heaven and shut it down. Shut it down. Okay. Are you guys what I'm saying? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The first night I came in here, a witch came to, to my hotel room. By the way, I have a beautiful hotel room. I was so mad. I said, you, how, how dare you come to such a good suite? Talk to me, somebody. 
Amen. I'm very sure uh, the man of God was not trying to pay for you as well. Are you getting what I'm saying? I rebuked this woman and she fell down. Are you catching what I'm saying? And I said to her, if you come again, I'll lock you out of your body. You won't get back to your body. She came out. Oh yeah. If you understand how to speak to the earth. Talk to me somebody. You leave your body. You, you better know. You, you better hope the one you're attacking doesn't know the mystery of the earth. Because I can lock your body. Because your body is dirt. She ran. The authority of the court of heaven is so powerful, my friends. It's real. It's a place of judgment. And the most high is the, is the, listen to me. In America, our Supreme Court, you know, you know, in America, I don't care who you are, whether you, how, what present you have, you know, you could toy, toy, do whatever. But when the Supreme Court rules, even if they rule wrong, like they did, you know, with some of the things that they have ruled in America, even when they rule wrong, once that, there's nothing to go. In other words, once the Supreme Court renders a judgment in American constitution, you can change it. You could hate the decision, but you have to abide by it or at least make adjustment for it because the highest court in the land has rendered its verdict. Cannot submit to you there is a court higher than the U.S. Supreme Court. It's called the court of heaven. As a matter of fact, let me tell you the reality of this. It's so powerful, man of God. A woman calls me, and she was desperate. A, a African mother. She had moved from Zimbabwe, gone to, to Canada. But you know, children, they never grown up in, around such liberty. He had, uh, the young boy, the 18-year-old boy, got careless. He was found in the wrong company. And they did something stupid. They were guilty. Someone said they were guilty. Okay? And so the judge was so upset. This judge, they, and unfortunately for the boy, he came before a judge who was notorious for long sentences. The lawyer said, we, we, could, not have put, we could not have picked the worst judge in this city in, than this judge. He's known. He loves, loves, he loves long sentences. And the lawyer said, we have to pray. This man doesn't know a short sentence. <laughs> this judge. And sure enough, the judge was lecturing, telling the boy, how can you, hey, you see, we will make an example of you. The boy is terrified, mother terrified. Lawyers in the chambers, they're trying, the judge was insistent. The boy, I think he was facing, uh, for, the, for the offense he was going to face, he was going to be a felon, plus he was going to face 18 months on a minimum in jail. In jail. His whole life was going to be torpedoed. Then the woman of God reached out, to me, talk to me somebody. I have a special love for Zimbabwe because that's, I'm, one of my apostleship in Africa is towards Zimbabwe. That's how I met Bishop Tudor Bismarck and those guys because of my ministry to Zimbabwe. And uh, so she got hold of me and, and I said, don't worry. The court of heaven is transgeographical and it does not require us to travel. We can meet in that court in the spirit. So I said, tell me what are the, what are the, issues, of, what are the issues of the issue? And she told me, I said, so your son is guilty. So great. Say, let's go before God. We can bring the son. Make sure so the boy and the son are on the other side of the line. And man of God, I took them in the court of heaven two days before the sentencing. And the lawyers already told her, it's not looking good. The judge is determined to make an example of your son. And so we go in the court of heaven. And we, are, we appeal, we make a plea of mercy. I mean, of mercy triumphs over judgment. So we made a case before, I mean, listen to me. Come on, somebody. I think, you know, I mean, one day I'll come back and just teach on the court of heaven. You know, just, there are many aspects, but let me just give a little bit here. So I, I told her, so we, we began to present the case. We brought before the Lord what Christ had done on the cross. We brought before the Lord the boy's destiny. We brought before the Lord the testimony, the godly testimony of the mother. All of that, I made it part of the presentation to, to the court of heaven. I said, Lord, we are asking. We know he's guilty. And the boy admitted, I am guilty as charged. Say, admit your guilt. Because Jesus said, when you're on your way to court, agree with your adversary. Don't try to lie when the devil knows you lie. You, you, are, you are guilty as hell. You know? And the devil knows you are guilty because it, he, he, come on, his demons drove you to the crime scene. Talk to me, sir, about it. Amen? They ubered you to the crime scene. So the devil already knows you are guilty. So don't lie about it. Just be honest about it. So we went before the Lord. And while we are in the court of heaven, a verdict was rendered. 
a verdict. See, the thing about what I told last night, when you truly understand this dimension, you're going to find out that you're going to begin now become aware to it. That means that when the Lord begins to talk to you, your modality of language in the realm of the Spirit is going to expand because God can only talk to a man to the extent of your revelation. So if your revelation does not allow God to speak to you about the code of heaven, God will be quiet, not because he can't talk about it, but if he talks about it, you won't even know what to do with it. That's the power of what you learned last night and learning tonight. So we went before the court of heaven and uh, man of God, a verdict was rendered. And I could hear, God said to me, a verdict has been rendered, okay? Mercy has been given to this young man. And now the court, or the court of heaven is going to impose the sentence because understand how the judiciary works. If you get a bad sentence with a lower court, the only way to turn it around is to go up. We court systems, in order to turn around, you go up. You never go down. That's why you've never seen any decision of the Supreme Court ever appealed because there's nothing to go. Except when you understand the code of heaven. Okay? But here's what happens. So, I said to, 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 the, to the mother, I said, I said, Mother, go in peace. Your son will never see you one day in jail. Now, you've got to know you heard from God to say that. In a very case that is very advanced, the lawyers have made their summations, the, uh, the state has made its summations, and there's a very adversarial judge who's really on the side of the prosecution. So they go to the court. Mother, they call the court. The boy is just, you know, he's wearing a suit, waiting to be handcuffed and led away, you know, and this judge, you know, says, well, he, he opens up his mouth. He says, you know, I really, I don't like what you did. I really don't like it. You know, young men like you belong in jail. So others can learn not to follow your example. So, so far it looked like it was not going good. And then he stopped. And he says, however. <laughs> the mother said to him, however, last night I had a change of heart. <laughs> young man. This is the first time I've ever done this. So don't ever tempt me again. And the lawyers were looking at each other. What is he saying? He said, I was going to give you the maximum sentence. And he tells him, you really deserve to be in jail for at least 18 months. You could see his nature wanted to do it. But there was a restraining order. From a superior court. Because the verdict had been rendered. By a higher court. And he said, okay. But here's what I'm going to do. If you would promise the court that this criminal offense is the last one of your life, if you can promise the court it's the last one of your life, that I will never see you in here for anything, then I'll give you lenience. So the boy he said, so the, so I said, talk back. He said, yes, sir. I promise. I am so sorry. I, and he, 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 I, I for, please forgive me. I will never, you'll never see me in court again. He says, he was quiet. He says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an 18-month suspended sentence. That means you'll be, you save it at your home. You save it at your house. But if you do anything in 18 months, I'll throw the whole book at you. And furthermore, if in 18 months you don't do anything wrong, this record, this offense will never appear on your record. This was what the mother was after. Somebody give God a shout. That's called the court of heaven. It's a real place. And today the Lord spoke to me that judgments are about to be rendered against evil altars that have held you back, held your destiny, killed your parents. Talk to me, some of your brothers and sisters right now, you have people, in your, everybody in your family gets degrees, they are PhDs, but if you look at them, they don't look like somebody with a PhD. Why? Because they are, ah, Rabbi Seketem. Altars are common, and even some of your family members even moved to America. And in America, they are still experiencing the same thing they were experiencing in Ghana. Why? Because altars, oh my God, they are accurate. They are more powerful than a GPS, my friend. They can locate you in Dallas. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Because I'm going to show you the only way to silence them and shut them down forever. Amen? Please take your seats. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen? Guys? I'm not going to my PowerPoint. 
I'm not going to my PowerPoint. I sent you a PowerPoint. I want to go fast. I want to go fast, but I, want to, I don't want you guys to lose anything. I don't want you to lose anything. Hallelujah. So, oh, Rabba Shikete. Shinde Bosaka. So we are going to go and look at destroying. So my subject tonight is destroying evil altars in your bloodline and nation or prosecuting evil altars in your bloodline and nation. Okay? We're going in your bloodline. We're going to be dealing with this. So if you can put thank you so much for the PowerPoint. We're going to go very fast because this will help me stay concise write the notes, take pictures with just whatever. But most importantly, I know this is being recorded on Facebook. You can review even after the fact so you don't get to lose what God wants to release. In order for us to understand altars, the subject of altars, and particularly how to destroy and persecute evil altars in the courts of heaven, we need to understand first the subject of altars. But before, but in order to up accurately understand the subject of altars, you, are, you will need to understand first why altars became necessary in the economy of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. We need to understand why altars. You know, as I was blown away when I wrote my two books on altars, I wrote a book called The Battle of Altars. By the way, what I'm teaching you now is from the book The Battle of Altars and Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven that Destroy Evil Altars. When I was raking on, the, on altars, I was blown away to discover when I did a word search of altars that the word altar appears more times in the Bible than the word prayer. Which was surprising to me, but it should not have been surprising because prayer is the activity of an altar, not the other way around. God said to me, because prayer which doesn't go through an altar is actually wishful thinking. Because only a, an altar can legitimize prayer. And I'm going to tell you why an altar is the only entity God designed that can legitimize prayer. That's why even witches, the enemy demands that they also have altars. Talk to me, somebody, for what they do. Okay? But why altars? Why are altars so prevalent in the Bible? You find them everywhere. Okay? In order to understand why altars and in how to destroy them, I want you permanently destroy them. So many of you can be free. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Some of you should already be millionaires except for the altars you're fighting. But after tonight, by next year, this time, you'll be walking in money you've never... Ah! I have no... Oh, talk to me, somebody. I hope I'm talking to somebody in Accra tonight. So, in order to understand altars, the first thing we must understand is uh, the law of dominion and territory. How the, that law of dominion and territory plays into the subject of altars and why God can never use a man who's not standing on an altar or coming through an altar and why the devil can never use a man who's not standing on an altar or coming through an altar. Please, let's turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis. I'm going to be using New King James now. Oh, but I'll just stay with the PowerPoints. Uh, media team, you don't, you don't need anything else except that what is in the PowerPoints. There's enough there for us to chew on. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. The Bible says this. Then God said, amen. He says what? Then God said, is that right? God said, let us make man in our image according to our what? Our likeness. Let them have dominion. Now, if you have a Bible, you'd want to, you'd really want to circle the word let them. Let them. Those words are important words. They are the, they are, they are, they are the two most consequential words to ever come out of the mouth of God. And in a short while, you'll find out why they are important and how they, they connect us to the world of altars. Let them have dominion over the uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Amen? Immediately move with me. When you see where I am, you move with me. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female. Ever say male and female? Come on, say it loudly. Say male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, Fill the earth and subdue it. 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that creep, that moves on the earth. Move what? Moves what? On the earth. This begs the question, what is dominion? Because this word appears several times. We need to understand it not from the English, but from the Hebrew. Because it doesn't come from English, it comes from Hebrew. The whole Bible was written in the Hebrew language. You know, Yeshua, when he was in the earth, spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. Okay, and the Bible comes from, those, from that very rich language. Okay, the Bible actually calls Hebrew a pure language. In lamentation, God promises to restore the Hebrew language in the last days. He said, I will restore unto you a pure language so my people can be one. One of the reasons why there's a difference even in lifestyle and, and, and breakthroughs between the Jews and the Gentiles is because the Jews read the Bible differently from the way we do because they understand it in its original language. But I believe that that gap is going to collapse in the last days. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. We're going to begin to understand it on the same level and begin to manifest the covenant of Abraham in the same way. But here's this. What is, but, but here's the question. What is dominion? Okay. Dominion, it comes from the Hebrew word mamlaka. Hebrew say mamlaka. Say with me mamlaka. So dominion is from the Hebrew word mamlaka. And it means to rule, sovereignty, to reign, kingdom, to master, to be king, to be in charge. Those are power. Is that amazing how, how much one word in the Hebrew can mean so much in the English? That's why translation is always a challenge in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew to English, because you lose a lot of words in the translation. But the mamlaka is the, is the word that was used. I'll give man mamlaka. Let them have mamlaka. Let them have sovereignty. Let them have uh, ability to reign. Let them have the ability to rule. Let them have a kingdom on the earth. That is a reflection of the one in heaven. Let them, let them have mastery on the earth. Let them be kings. Talk to me somebody. Amen. And most importantly, let them be in charge. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, when it comes to the earth, we are in charge. Make no mistake about it. We are in charge. That's why it, it, it grieves the heart of God to see demons running rampant in your world because it simply means you're not taking responsibility for your mamlaka. Uh, so, uh, what is dominion? Okay, now let's define, uh, what is dominion? Okay, let's now put, it, let's put all those words in a, in, a, in a tablet we can understand. In a working tablet, we can understand. Because it's very difficult to function in what you cannot define. So now that we have, we, have, we have broken down what dominion or mamlaka means in the Hebrew, now let's put those words together. And I borrow the, 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 this definition from my, my spiritual mentor, the late Dr. Miles Monroe, okay, who had the privilege of meeting in the Bahamas. And from that time, we are connected to the day the Lord Jesus took him to heaven. Okay, dominion means to be established as a sovereign. It means to be established as what? As a sovereign. Amen. Listen, my friend, God sees you on earth as a sovereign. That's why when Adam and Eve sinned, God never went to Satan first. Do you know, God never spoke to the serpent. The serpent was spoken to, uh, the serpent was only spoken to, as a matter of fact, the, spoken, the serpent was only judged after God had spoken to Adam. Adam, where you are? He never said, Satan, where are you? Because Mamlaka was never given to spirits, it was given to the children of men. So, talk to me, somebody. Okay, the way God handled the fall of man shows you how powerful you are. The problem is our religious spirits do not allow us to take responsibility for who we are in the kingdom. Okay, it's so easy to say God is in control because if God is in control, I don't have to take ownership of my mamlaka. Watch this now. It says this. So it means to be sovereign, to be established, to be established as a sovereign, kingly ruler, master, governor, responsible for reigning over a, dis a designated territory, which for us is earth, ever say earth, with inherent, with inherent authority to represent and embody as a symbol. This is why the enemy can make, this is where the enemy loves witchcraft. Why? Because witchcraft, it because, talk to me somebody, because witchcraft is the devil understanding the power of Mamlaka. He goes to men, talk to me somebody, whether they are born again or not doesn't matter because it was man in a flesh body that was given the ability to be a symbol and a representation of the planet. So the covenants they make affect earth. Because as much as we hate them, they have the legal right to make them because they carry the same gift we carry. The only difference is our gift is now supported by redemption. 
Are you catch what I'm saying? Are you with me so far? You know, that it says with, with inherent authority to represent and embody as a symbol the territory, resources, and all that constitutes that kingdom. That means, therefore, because of Mamlaka or dominion, when Abraham, when Adam fell, when Adam fell, he did not just fall by himself, he fell with everything connected to him, even the symbol of everything, resources, everything fell with Adam because he was a symbol of everything. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? So watch this now. Because of dominion, watch this now. Now, now, now this leads me to another important question. We, we are getting closer to the subject of altars. I'm laying a foundation because you can't get into altars until you understand how altars became important in the economy of God. And when you understand them, then you understand how to deconstruct them when they are appearing in your life and hindering your destiny from the demonic side of things. But also you know how to build them right from the righteous side for your own destiny. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? So are you with me so far? Okay. Amen. We're going to have some miracles tonight. I'm telling you. Amen. I'm trying to leave some. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it with the PowerPoint because I want to get to praying quickly so I have enough time to pray for the sick. Does that make sense? Amen. Hallelujah. So, this begs the question who was dominion given to? Who was Mamlaka what? Given to? That, you know, it may, seem, it may sound simple. But I'm telling you, the most powerful things in life are simple. Okay? It is simple but profound. Profound in its ramifications and completely now will explain in a short while the subject of altars. Who was given dominion? I wanted to notice that when God gave dominion, he gave it, so he says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Ever say male and female? He created them. Is that right? Now remember at the beginning of Genesis 1.26, it says, let us make man in our image of our likeness. Let them have what? Dominion or mamlaka. Is that right? Let them. Now God wanted to make sure that there is no ambiguity who the them is. Dr. Eric, he went further and explains in the contract of dominion who dominion was given to. Why? Because God already knew Lucifer and the other celestial beings are already fallen. So God did not want any ambiguity about who can, who's in charge over the planet called Earth. So God says this dominion is connected to only two genders, male and female. By the way, dominion is gender sensitive. That's why if you understand that, you understand why all of a sudden America is leading the world in gender confusion, gender dysphoria. Why? Because the devil is after... See, the devil doesn't care if you're none. The, the devil doesn't care what your sexuality is. If he can give him access to what he wants. You see, Mamlaka was given to the male and female. The moment you deny any of these two genders, you give up Mamlaka. Now the devil can use your body without paying for it. Oh my God, have mercy. So, are you catching what I'm saying? So dominion is gender what? Sensitive. Are you catching what I'm saying? Male and female. Now you know that there's no male or female in the spirit. Are you catching what I'm saying? Gender. So by God saying male and female, he makes it clear that dominion is given to spirits in physical bodies of dirt that are either male or female. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? Mamlaka, dominion, is that right? Is given what? Dominion is what? Given to male and female. It's given to what? Male and female. Okay? It's given to male and female. Because, you know, that's what God, God ties it. But notice how God does it. When God gives dominion or mamlaka, he, it's the words he used that now will demand a place of exchange to deal with the problem God himself has created in order to make you a king. In order to give you a king, God had to give you a separate territory. Are you with me? Because in kingdoms, king, king, let me just use, let's use the British crown, for instance. It's the only remaining monarch we have in the world today. You see, in, uh, provided uh, Prince Charles stays in England, he can only be a prince. Are you catching what I'm saying? 
But let's say Prince Charles decided, I, Mama, I don't want to be a prince. I want to experience kingship. Well, what the mother would do to obligate the son is to give him another territory away from Britain. That's what God did. If the son, see if a king, if a son of a king stays with the king, he remains a prince. But if, he, if the father wants to see that the son handle kingship, then the father has to go out of his way to, create, to colonize the territory where his son can be a king without being big in protocol with the original kingdom. Are you with me so far? God, see, eh, watch this. Ducks produce ducks. Is that right? Rats produce rats. Kings produce kings. God is a king. Are you guys what I'm saying? Amen? God's family is the only family where every child is a king. Yeah. To treat yourself any less than that is, is actually a lack of revelation on, of your path. But as far as God is concerned, he, kingship is what he had for you. So because he understood how kingdoms work, that if the son remains in my kingdom, he can only become what? A prince. But I don't want him to be a prince. I want him to test the power of kingship. So God built another reality called earth. He made it terrestrial because his world is celestial. Are you with me? He made his world celestial. Okay? And gave it a different type of body. 1 Corinthians 15. Then he made a terrestrial world and gave it a different type of body. White, black, common some brown. He gave it a different type of body. Watch this now. But to separate the two worlds... To make sure that there's the border between the invisible kingdom and this new kingdom. Talk to me, somebody. To make sure that there's the border between the kingdom of, of, uh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth that God has given to Adam, God created Mamlaka as the border between heaven and earth. Are you seeing that? And how does he do it? Because of, how he, because of the language he uses. It's an exclusive contract. Okay? Let's say, for instance, are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? Are, are, you, are you with me? Okay. You know, if, if a company gives you, if Apple gives you, a company gives you exclusive distribution rights of everything Apple in Ghana, it also means Apple itself can come and do, do a store in Ghana without talking to you because that would be a violation of contract. Yeah. Yeah. So God says, let them have dominion. He didn't say let them and us. So by excluding the Godhead, he really made you a sovereign. That means now God has created a problem for himself. Are you catching what I'm saying? Are you catching what I'm saying? <laughs> so watch this. I'm not use language you can understand, but we're talking about altars. Are you catching what I'm saying? In Ghana, are you with me somebody? In Ghana, if, 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 uh, if President Biden, talk to me somebody, Amen begins to make policy for Ghana, how are you going to react? You are going to, the, first the, you're present the whole government of Ghana who rise. Why? Because it's called, what? Interference in the affairs of a sovereign state. Yeah. Yeah. So if America wants to influence Ghanaian policy, there is a diplomatic way of doing it. Yeah. That's why they established the diplomatic call. So literally, the embassies are altars of nations. <laughs> are you with me, Sova? They provide a legal channel for nations to influence each other without interfering in each other's governance. Oh my God. Whew, are, you, are you with me, somebody? So God understands it. He's a sovereign. He understands governments. Said, Adam, do you know what I've done with you, my boy? I have made you a sovereign in earth. That means, therefore, even for me to come into your world, I will now need your cooperation. Outside of your cooperation, I may be sovereign in the fact that I own everything, but when it comes to moving by the Spirit, I'm locked out if I can't find an Eric to say, yes, Lord. Are you with me, Samba? This is the power of Mamlaka. Why do you think Satan used a serpent to go to the woman? Because he was also locked out. 
He was a celestial being. As a celestial being, the law of Mamlaka may... Are you catching what I'm saying? Talk to me, somebody. Are you with me so far? Somebody said we are talking about altars. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, the law of dominion and territory, let me give you a definition, states that, let me give you this law. Because of Mamlaka, it spawned, Mamlaka spawned a law. It's a law that God and the devil don't violate, but they know how to work around it. Okay? The law of what? Dominion and territory simply states that spirits without physical bodies of dirt are illegal on earth unless they are functioning through a human. This, my friend, is an unbreakable law of the kingdom. Say it with me. Spirits without physical bodies of dirt. No, we can be louder than that. Say spirits without physical bodies of dirt are illegal on earth unless they are functioning through a human. This is an unbreakable law of God. Are you catching what I'm saying? And by the way, all you have to do is study your Bible. God has never broken Mamlaka. Because a king who breaks his own word is not a king worth having. And, king, and God is a greater king than Darius was. And as much as Darius loved Daniel, he could not break his own word to deliver Daniel. So he started praying. So he became an intercessor. Why? Because the laws of the patients could not be broken. Once the patient king ruled, it cannot be revived. Even when the king found out that he had been lied to by his own ministers, or corrupt ministers, they were trying to get rid of the one minister who checked them all. When he discovered it, it still could not change the laws of the Medes and the patients. Now, if you think a human king could not change his word, you think the king of kings, who speaks from foreknowledge, has to come because, oops, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to tell you to become a billionaire. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. I meant he, 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 he doesn't do that. So God, that's why God doesn't speak a lot. When he does speak, he becomes, see, God, that's why when God speaks, he becomes, uh, he, submit, he heals. You oppress your word above your name. God does what he does using his name. Then he places what he said under his word. That's what it means. So that's the word. So every Bible, you find God looking for the man. Why do you think God went to the back of the desert? He wanted to deliver 3 million Jews. He heard their cries every day. And for 40, he heard their cries. For how long? For a lot of years. But why did he not deliver them? Because it took that long to raise a Moses. But one day, God met a Moses and said, I want to deliver them. I want to deliver them. But I cannot come into the sovereign territory and go and deliver them by myself without violating the law of territory. So I need a man whom the territory recognizes as a sovereign working with me and together we'll date the people out. And that's how it works. Are you with me so far? So because of, the, of, of, this, of this law of dominion, but let me give you some anchor scriptures. Then I'm going to go into altars and then I'm going to go into court of heaven. Are you excited? Is this, is this helping you? With the PowerPoints, amen? Let me give you some anchor scriptures that anchor the law of dominion. What? Territory. Psalm 115 verse 16. Here's what it says. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. Is that right? The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. But, ever say but. The earth he has given to the children of what? Men. Say the earth. He has given to who? But the heavens of heaven belong to what? So, I, I, come on somebody, amen? So, let me tell you something. This might blow, bust your bubble. But you don't have authority in heaven. You don't. You might want to be super spiritual, and the enemy will, will, will turn you, because the enemy is a perverter, he will turn you. And you're so worried about things happening in heaven when you, when you should worry about things happening on earth. Because earth is your territory. Talk to me somebody. That's why you notice when any man of God, no matter the powerful, the mighty Benson in Daosa, the mighty Oral Roberts, the mighty Billy Graham, the moment they lost their bodies, they became illegal as authorities on the earth because they became celestial. So they have to live. 
What do you think would happen today if somebody told you Billy Graham is coming to, to, Ghana, to Ghana for a, a crusade? Ah, you'll be like, ah, which, which Billy Graham? Oh, no, no, the one that died. But he did. Yeah, but his spirit is coming. Ah, the people in Ghana, his spirit. Because internally, you know, spirits are not supposed to be preaching to the living. Talk to me, somebody. It's Mamlaka that does all of that. That's why Jesus, that's why the resurrection of Jesus was a massive miracle. Because Jesus was resurrected not as a spirit, but as a man. So when he showed up and walked through the wall, he said, hey, don't be afraid of me. Because I may be Superman, but I'm still a man. Because the spirit has no bones and he has no flesh. Ha! Talk to me, somebody. That's why Jesus is the only, you don't understand. Jesus is the only one in the heavenly realms who can come in on earth in and out by will and actually preach the gospel if he wanted to without asking you because without why because he cut his mamlaka. He was resurrected as a man, so he comes back to earth as a man. My God, are you catching what I'm saying? But the Holy Spirit can do that. He has, to, he has to prod you, convict you, work with you. He will even wait 10 years until you say yes. And then the change starts because it took 10 years for you to say, okay, Lord, I'll go in the ministry. Why couldn't the Holy Spirit open the church by himself? He's a spirit. He's a... Are you with me, somebody? Next verse, anchor. Jesus comes on the earth. And he actually ascribes to the same testimony. He actually anchors it even better. He re-explains re Mamlaka in a New Testament context. But it's the same thing. Matthew 18, 18 to 19. This is Jesus talking now. Again, I said to you, to you, that if two of you agree on where? Notice he makes sure you know the territory this earth or dominion. He's not, he didn't say... On heaven, because you have no authority in heaven. You have residency when you die, but not authority. <laughs> if any two of you shall agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is where? In heaven. Two territories. <laughs> but notice who's initiating and who's responding. You are the initiator, God is responding. When you operate in your dominion, God is a responder. You pray, God moves. You fast, God moves. Who's responding? It's your territory. If you are tired of poverty in your bloodline, God, said to, God says, I'm tired of it too. That's why I have a whole Bible full of, I want to bless you, but what are you going to do about it? That's why when you, tonight when you come before the Lord and you drag those evil altars in your bloodline and say, Lord, I'm tired of these devils, of these entities messing with my, my destiny, guess what? Heaven will respond to your request. And you're going to see miracles, signs and wonders in your life. Things are going to shift, I'm telling you. As surely I said to you, whatever you bind, who's binding? Whatever you bind, where? On earth. Will be bound, where? In heaven. And whatever you lose on earth, will be loose in heaven. You see, Mamlaka is so powerful to God, and the realm of the spirit, and whenever God says a demon or witchcraft in your bloodline, he doesn't go to the witch, he does, he, he's not concerned about the spirit in your family. He wants to find that who in your family opened the door for the spirit to enter. That's where the recovery must begin. Adam, where you are, is I must begin. Why? What about the devil? You see, notice all Adam and Eve, Adam put it on his wife, his wife put it on the Satan. God said, But it's you I gave them, it's you are the one I gave Mamlaka. You are the sovereign in the earth. And he, he, God judged him as a sovereign. Let's continue now. Now, because of this, the law of dominion made earth into the world of men. Say with me, earth is the world of men. 
This is why if you are foolish enough not to understand this, you're not going to go anywhere. You're never going to anchor your destiny. You know, stuff like, you know what? I just want, I mean, I just love the Lord. I mean, I'm just going to spend time with the Holy Ghost. I don't, listen to me. I don't care about people. Provided the Lord, provided the Lord loves me, let me tell you something. You know, it, it sounds nice, but it's, too, it's foolishness. Because even Jesus understood when you're in the world of men, you need favor with God and man. The problem when some of you are in the same place, God likes you, but people don't like you. You need, you need both. God must give you favor with God and with men. I you catch what I'm saying? You know, I didn't just come to open heavens because God loves me. I came to open heavens because the man over, over in charge invited me. So I, I need to have favor with Eric, not just with God. Oh, God likes me. Oh, okay, God loves you. you. You and God, you go and have fun, but get out of this church. Ah, but, but God, but God, God, no, Dr. Miles, you know, God loves you. But when it comes to open heaven, I'm the pastor. You see what I'm saying? You need, you need both. See, you understand how these things work. Jesus grew, he grew well, in favor with God and with man. Why would the Son of God, why would the perfect man want to have favor with men? Because he understood there were, uh, there were aspects of his destiny men had to deliver. Talk to me, somebody. Are you catching what I'm saying? You think if, if, if Jesus, if God never, listen to me, you talk about, oh, the, the disciples following Jesus, that's important. But Jesus was a man. He was a man, and he was revealed to them over time. They just did not know him one day. You catch what I'm saying? Actually, there was a time they didn't, they, uh, there was a time they just thought it was another prophet. Yeah. That's why I asked them, who do men say that I am? Some of his disciples, oh, but over time they grew in their understanding of who he was. So don't you think he, he, he also needed favor with those men? He grew in favor with God and with man. But now, now let's go into, because the law of dominion made the earth into the world of men, how did God solve the problem of sovereignty? How does God, now here's what God did. This is amazing. God decided to build an interface. Somebody say an interface. God decided to build what? An interface between the two worlds. Between the celestial and the what? The terrestrial. An interface. Okay? An interface in technology is the gate that stands between two different softwares. That's, that's called an interface. It interfaces two different entities, but allows them to communicate so you can do transactions. Are you catching what I'm saying? If you go to my website right now and you want to buy a book, I, I own the website but I don't own the payment gateway for collect money from you. PayPal does. So what did PayPal do? PayPal created an interface or what is known in technology as an API. Applied Programming Interface. Is that right? Every software has them. Why? Because PayPal knows they don't own my website. Is that right? But they have got what I need for the, website, for the transaction that begins on my website to be concluded on their end, then revert back to me so I know I've been paid and I can release the book. Are you catching what I'm saying? Authors are the API of the realm of the spirit. <laughs> so God says, you know what? I'm not going to interfere. But here's what God did, what God's wisdom did. God told him, first, here's what I did. In my wisdom. Because God never created us, gave us dominion, and then walked away and said, you are on your own. God is a father. He wanted us to extend the family business. How can we extend the family business if we don't hear from our father? Are you catching what I'm saying? Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? <laughs> so what did God do? He designed an interface you call an altar. He designed an interface... That will allow man as a sovereign to come to the table and God as a sovereign to come to the table and two sovereigns negotiate the exchange. Watch this. God said to me, Francis, I, oh, Mamlaka is about authority to be in charge. So authority is in the world of men. Say with me. Authority is in the world of men. But power is in the world of spirit. Because God is a genius. He knew if he gave us both, many of us will never see him again. <laughs> the only time we'll see him is when we're about to die. We're 90 years. Lord, I'm about to come now. So what did God do? What did God do? 
He allowed power. That's what the Bible says. Once ever heard, God has spoken his words, but twice ever heard that power belongs to God. So power belongs to the world of spirit, but authority belongs to the world of men. So where power and authority meet to negotiate, that's an altar. That's why Satan being a copycat, because Satan has nothing original. He's simply a copycat. And somebody told me, there's nothing wrong with being a copycat, provided you copy the right cat. Talk to me, somebody. And Satan is a master because he knows whatever God does, it shall be forever. So he just reverses engineers what God is doing. So God, Satan saw how God was entering the world of men. He's like, okay, he's a celestial being. How does he get in the Garden of Eden and they are walking together? How can he get in? Me as a spirit, because remember the angel that fallen already. Lucifer and one third was already fallen when Adam was created. But they couldn't get in because there was an invisible brother called Mamlaka. That was keeping them apart. And we figured it out. He figured it out. If I can convince something, anything, with a body. Talk to me, somebody. Anything with a body. I can use that body to get close to the woman who carries Mamlaka and the men. So guess what? I don't know what happened. Somehow, because the Bible said, of all the, of all the, of all the creatures God had made in the garden, there was nothing more wise and shrewd than the serpent. Oh, by the way, I call it Jewish tradition. I go into Jewish tradition. The, the, the serpent of Eden, the original serpents, could talk. And then they walked. They didn't crawl. Serpents crawl because of judgment, and they, they hiss because their voice was taken. <laughs> Why? Because whatever happened, the Bible doesn't go into it, but, it, but Satan met with the serpent. Because it was the only creature in the garden that could talk the language of man. And, and it was cunning. Oh, somebody help me. It was what? It was cunning. Now, how do you know this? Because if serpents could not talk, Dr. Eric, don't you think, don't you think that, thank you, don't you think that the woman... You know, women, don't you think the woman who would have been screaming? Imagine you go home today and your dog says, I was church. Ah! <laughs> Why? Because you don't expect the dog to talk. But if you go home and your daughter says, Mama, I was church, you won't scream because you expect your daughter to talk. So why did, why, did, why did Eve not stop and say, wait a minute, this is very abnormal. Serpent, why are you talking to me? It's because the serpent already talked. It was a normal thing. The difference this time is... It's not good enough. I need man to save me. Then that's how I become like him because men save him. So he slid, So the serpent went to the woman and they talked. Notice how God spoke to the serpent. And to the serpent, God said, He was talking to it. And to the serpent, there were three judgments in there to the man, Adam, to you, to the woman. He spoke to three entities. And then the fourth entity was Satan himself. In the prophecy of the Messiah. He shall bruise your head. But the first beginning was the natural serpent, then the spiritual serpent. Now Satan, because you've chosen, uh, you've chosen to use the body of a serpent to deceive my children. From now, you also won't be known as an angel, you'll be known as a snake. So from that time, Lucifer himself became the serpent, because that's, that's the body he borrowed. So God decided an altar was necessary, an interface. So let me go through this very quickly. Are you, are you catching this? Yes. Okay. Look at, look at Genesis 8, 20, 8, 20, 21. And Noah built an altar, is that right? Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean what? Fire or bird and burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, 
a scent of satisfaction to his heart, the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imagination of his man's heart is evil and wicked from his youth. Neither will I ever again smite and destroy every living thing as I've done. Notice God's respond to an altar. Showing us already in an altar's are powerful interfaces, they can reverse curses into blessings. If you know how to use them. If you know how to build them. Talk to me somebody. Amen? So watch this now. Let's define an altar very quickly. I'm going to take five minutes defining the altar. And then we're going to talk about the court of heaven very quickly. And we'll have, we'll have enough time to be able to begin to pray. Amen? And break some things. Harabo sakata. Let's define an altar. What is an altar, Dr. Mouse? An altar is a spiritual portal, a place or is a spiritual portal or place of exchange where spirits and in brackets we have God, angels, or demons land. Okay? It is where humanity meets with divinity. An altar also functions as it functions as a supernatural landing strip, as in Jacob. When Jacob got to Bethel, there was the ascending and descending of angels. Why? Because an altar was there, so just acting like the, the international airport right here. A meeting place. That's why sometimes when you, when, when you in, even in deliverance now, we used to do it. I don't understand. When I, when I come in the kingdom, I, because of Derek Prince and other people like that, I was exposed to means of deliverance and began to pray for people, whatever, but after a while, I began to notice, I began to notice a phenomenon. Certain people, they would, you would pray for them, demons would leave, they would be free for the months or whatever, and then all of a sudden, they are dealing with the same thing. Now I know why. God said to me, see, what happens, Francis, when you cast out the demons, but you leave the altar function. Yeah. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's like closing the airport for a while. That's like, well, well, come on, but that's like, taking the planes out of the airport, but the airport is still functioning. Soon enough, one day, the airport itself will begin to attract the spirit that land on it. So now when you're doing deliverance, man of God, we deal with both the altar, the spirits we're functioning from, and the spirits themselves. And we are experiencing people getting delivered and staying free. An altar is a meeting place. Every time God wanted to meet with a man, he made it an altar. An altar is a power station. Hello, Elijah. The God, I'll build an altar, and you'll build an altar, and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And the altar that Elijah built brought fire down because altars are power stations in the realm of the spirit. An altar is a spiritual platform. An altar is a consecrated place. An altar is a table of fellowship. That's why in Hebraic understanding, understanding the altar is that's why you could make covenants or when, you, when you're having a meal. Because in the Hebrew, uh, uh, one of the words for an altar is a table of fellowship. Altars are also assist divine systems of authorization for covenants, promises, and rituals. Every time you see a covenant in the Bible, it's being made at an altar. Okay, promises are being made around that. When uh, Jacob and uh, Laban were trying to, to promise each other, they will never attack each other, they will never cross a border to attack each other. You know how they did it? They pulled an altar. They built, took a heap of stones, and that altar became a, a what? A point, it became what? An, a system of authorization of that promise and covenant. And you notice one of the things that uh, 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 Laban told uh, Ab, uh, jo, uh, Jacob is that. He said, not only should, none of us should ever cross this boundary uh, with, with harm. If, if that happens, then our gods must strike us, okay? But there's something else he told him, you should never take another wife. Is that amazing? That, that Jacob goes, man of God, Jacob goes into the promised land, becomes one of a super wealthy man, and Rachel dies on the way to the promised land, and Jacob remains married to an ugly woman. The Bible says, Elia could hardly, she had two kind eyes, okay? Trust me, if Jacob, would, in that day, Jacob wanted, probably wanted to get another woman, but you know why he couldn't get another woman? Because of the covenant he had made back in the day. In, in some ways, he was being a man, he's, 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 he's miles away from from the altar, but not with an altar. You are never miles away. Jacob's lifestyle, he could never pick up another wife. Why? Because that altar, that was part of the covenant of that altar that Laban told him, if you should never, if you ever do it, your own God will be a witness against you. So even though he lived in a culture where men would marry multiple wives, notice when Rachel died, Jacob died with Leah, never married because of that altar. 
Some of you are trying to go to the next level. Are trying to go to the next level, but there are altars that are speaking. That's why you, 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 know, you take five steps in front, ten steps backwards, because an altar is speaking. But tonight, we'll silence that, those evil altars. <laughs> Amen? So I have a question for you. Some people, when they hear me teach on altars, they ask this. Are altars Old Testament teaching? Altars are neither Old nor New Testament. They are ancient paths. It was an ancient paths. Jeremiah 16, chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible talks about the ancient path. Discover the ancient path where the good way is that there may be rest for your souls. An ancient path, the word ancient comes from Hebrew word olam, which means something that is timeless. Timeless. So an altar is what? Timeless. Because it originates from eternity, so you cannot bind it in time. So an altar is neither Old nor New Testament because it is a timeless principle, okay? So examples, the law of gravity is an ancient path. No matter what you do, if what goes up must come down. The law of redemption, everything must be done by blood. No matter what you do, blood must be involved in redemption. You know, all, and we can continue with that. Altars are so transcendent that they are found in both heaven and earth. Check this out. Next slide. Altars are in heaven. So if altars are, 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 come on somebody, Old Testament, then I'm sorry. The Bible didn't get the memo because look at the heaven is full of altars. Look at this. Uh, Revelation 6 verse, this is in heaven, not on earth. When the lamb broke the first, the feast seal, I saw underneath the altar, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Revelation 8 verse, verse 13. Another angel came and stood at the altar in heaven. Behold, a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add to it, what, to the altars, the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. Man of God, there's an altar right before the throne. You can't run away from altars. I catch what I'm saying. That's why Satan knows their power, because he was in heaven before he fell. If, if anybody knows how to work through altars, it's the devil. He was in heaven. Okay? So watch this now. There are two types of altars. Genesis 4, verse 3 to 5. Okay? In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the foot of the ground, and Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fatty portions. And the Lord had respect and regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no respect or regard. So Cain was exceedingly angry and indignant, and he looked sad and depressed. Well, there are two types of altars in the Bible uh, which are represented by the two brothers, Abel and Cain. Abel built a righteous altar, a godly or righteous altar, and then Cain built an evil altar. How do we know? We know even from his own reaction was demonic. He was sad, he was arrogant, he was depressed, he was proud. All of that, the moment he gave his offering, some, a nature rose in him that was more satanic than anything of ever. It was so satanic, the Bible let us say, and Cain is of the evil one. Are you catching what I'm saying? Actually, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the first, the first homicide in the Bible had to do with altars. No. Talk to me, somebody. The first spilling of blood in the Bible had to do with altars. Okay? Now, among the altars, so even though there are two types of altars, there are two dimensions of the altars. Mobile and stationary. When it comes to mobile altars, God's vision is for every child of God to become a mobile altar. That when you show up, things begin to happen. Exchanges begin to happen between men and earth, and will, men and heaven that will never happen until you showed up. So I, I am a living altar, I'm telling you. So my being here means there is about to be supernatural exchanges in your life. That you look back and say, when Dr. Mouse was here, that's when that problem came to an end. Why? Because I'm a mobile altar. But there's also stationary altars, like the one you build in your house. And by the way, read my book, uh, uh, The Battle of Altars. I actually teach you the mystery of how to pay your bills. You know, God gave me a mystery. He said, Francis, do you know the story, of, the story of Obed Edom? I said, yes. You know what it means, the principle behind it? He said, it means it's a very simple principle. Teach my people this. The altar, the stationary altar you build in a house and dedicate to the Lord is the one responsible for paying the bills, not your job. So many of you... You are stressed because you are paying bills by job instead of paying them by altar. It's in the book. I go very deep. Change people's lives radically, radically in it. So, can, can we continue? Here we are. Okay? So, here is a key statement, just a key statement for you to remember. Altars 
are raised and sustained by what? Sacrifice. So if you don't want to live a sacrificial life, I doubt you ever have a strong righteous altar that can speak for generations in your life. That's what David understood in 2 Samuel 24, verse 16 to 25. When he talks about, when he says, the king said to Aranua, no, but I'll surely buy it. When Aranua wanted to give a piece of property for free, but the king said, no, you don't understand. There's a plague in the land and I need an altar to make an exchange. I will allow God to stop the killing and let me find forgiveness and whatever. So he understood. David understood. How you make exchanges with the realm of the spirit is not by begging, it's by building altar. So the king said to Aranua, no, but I will surely buy it from you for the price. For now, now will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver, a lot of money. And David built there an altar to the Lord. Why? And offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord reheeded the prayers for the land. Notice that God, notice that all the praying that happened before the altar was built just went past. God told me prayers that are not connected to an altar is wishful thinking. But when prayer is connected to an altar, it becomes legislative. Wow. Amen. So here's a key statement. Here's a key statement. Say with me. Say it with me. The only place where we can fully destroy or prosecute an evil altar is in the court of heaven. Is in the court of what? Heaven. Why? Now, 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 now say it with me. Say it with me. Is it, is it, say it with me. Say this is because altars are legal entities in the spirit world. And so only a court of law can fully destroy their power and end their demonic reign in our lives. Now, Dr. Miles, do we have a biblical example of an altar being judged in the scriptures from the court of heaven? I'm glad you asked me. Here it is, right here. Amen? So I want you right now to go to the book of... Okay, you don't have to go to it. It's right on the PowerPoint. Amen? Let's, let's just go to it right now. We see it in uh, first... What? 1 Kings 13. An interesting story shows up in 1 Kings 13 to, to 1 verse 7. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jehoram stood by the altar to burn incense. Notice where the king was. By the altar to burn incense because the king was the attendant to this evil altar in the nation. Then the man cried against the altar. He cried against the altar, not the man, the altar. He cried against the altar by the word of the Lord. Altar, altar. Now, Dr. Garrick, why would a man of God speak to an altar unless altars can hear your voice in the spirit when you prophesy, when you begin to speak? Altar, altar. He's not talking to the man of God. He completely ignores the king who's the attendant to the evil altar. Completely ignores him and just focuses on the altar. That is what we're about to do in a few seconds. Altar, altar. That says the Lord. Talk to me, somebody. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And on you he shall offer the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be bent on you. And he gave a sign the same day. My friend, the altars will be destroyed the same day, tonight. Saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar of your father's house, <laughs> of your mother's house shall be split and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. When King Jehoram heard the words of the man of God, the man of God cried against the altar in Bethel. He thrust out his hand saying, lay hold of him and his hand which he put forth against him dried up because when an altar is judged in the court of heaven those who are using it against you cannot when they use it again the judgment ah talk to me somebody there are people i'm telling you you have to be careful there are people um, who do, who, there are people who must be very careful not to mess with you tonight because you might find there's a funeral in your neighborhood because there's somebody threw on the broom last night, tonight, trying to mess with you, only to discover the altar has been destroyed. And talk to me, somebody. The, the king 
was trying to pull power from the altar. Actually, I love the new king. It says, when the, ki the, when the king tried to strike him from the altar, meaning the power to strike him was from the altar. Why would he do it? Just because he knew the altar was for power. So he wanted to strike him. The only problem is the altar had been judged from the court of heaven. He had no more power to support the attendant. So his hand dried up. So he could not draw it to him again. The altar, uh, Dr. Eric, was also split. And the ashes were poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God. Could it be God brought this man of God all the way from America to destroy an altar that is standing between you and becoming a millionaire. Standing on the, an altar that has stopped you from building a house. An altar that has stopped you from being, being married. Uh, come on somebody. An altar that has stopped you from giving birth to children. An altar that has stopped your children from going to school. Could it be this man of God was sent by the Lord? To bring the judgment of the court of heaven against that evil altar of your father's house. That evil altar of witches that have come against you. That evil altars that are speaking against you even at your place of work. Some of you are overdue for promotion. Except the people around you have altars that are pressing your promotion. But I tell you tonight, I tell you tonight, I tell you tonight, you will be promoted from the headquarters. Karabasate, shandabakasete. Ah, hallelujah. Are you with me somebody? Come on, pray in tongues. I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. We have got to go in the court of heaven. Pray in tongues. The altar was split. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign. Which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God. Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God. Pray for me. That my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord. And the king's hand was restored as before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. We're about to go in the court of heaven. I want you guys to go to the bottom. Bottoms. I want you to go to the bottom. Uh, to, the, uh, to the second last a slide just go to it just go to it we're about to go how can you recognize how do you can how can you discern an evil altar is at work in your life it's very simple and i'm saying that because i want you to get ready amen as we go in the court of heaven altars one of the ways altars are known altars who always reveal themselves by their rituals what is the, the ritual of an altar is a cycle of an altar that the attendant to the altar, which means in this case you, keeps finding yourself in. A ritual is a re repetitive activity that keeps happening again and again. How many know you losing money can be human? You can lose money because you forgot where it is. But losing money again and again and again is no longer normal. An altar is involved. A money stealing altar is now involved. Because you keep going through the ritual. And the ritual of the altar is also the food of the altar. How do you know? Talk to me, somebody. The, you know, the, the, every altar eats. Somebody tell me, every altar eats. And the food of the altar, say, say, the food of the altar is the ritual of the altar. So let me, what, what do I mean? So if the, if the altar is an altar, talk to me, somebody, amen, of alcohol, is that right? Alcoholism, it's an altar of alcohol, is that right? When the, when the altar is, 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 is thirsty, the human attendant who be driven to drink because that is the ritual and the food of the altar. Mm. He will drink. But once he's sober, the family comes around, you, you are going to destroy yourself. Please stop this. When the attendant, when the altar is addressed, the attendant is back to himself. Mm. During counseling, he will, promise you, he will promise you the truth. I want to stop. You know, this is the end. This is the end. The altar is sleeping. <laughs> When the otter is wanting to eat again, it rises. It becomes so overwhelming. And before he knows it, he's looking around and he sneaks out. And you find what the otter needs to eat. It can happen with addiction. It can happen with so many things. Go said me, Francis. When you understand otters, you deliver so many people. Mm. We have delivered people. People addicted to drugs like this overnight. No, no, I'm telling you, drugs in the system. How do you explain that? Take them in the court of it once. 
and the ritual ends like that. Mm. Lift your hands. What I want to do is, I want you to think about the rituals. Think about the cycles you keep going through. Maybe write, the, think, think about the cycles, because we're, we're going to go in the court of heaven. And then I'm going to tell you to subpoena the altars in the court of heaven. But you need to know what they are. So I want you to look at the cycles. What are the cycles you keep going through again and again? Or maybe your family members. Doesn't matter where they live. The same things happen to everybody. That's the cycle of the altar. You have identified that if, if the cycles do not reflect the image and character of Jesus, it's the evil altar. How you can show what I'm saying? You are happy two days, then you are depressed. Happy two days, then you are depressed. Happy two days, then you are depressed. Happy a week, you are depressed. Look at the cycle. How you got what I'm saying? Angry, I mean, angry, angry for four days, then you are good again. Angry again next week. And, you, and it doesn't matter what you're angry about. <laughs> it could, for the stupid reasons, the author just wants to eat anger or rage, because that is an author of rage. But you can be delivered tonight. Pray this prayer after me. But remember, there's coming a time in today. Tonight is different from yesterday. There's coming tonight a time when I'm going to tell you, name the authors. And then you are going to name the authors because you know what you're dealing with. Then I'll continue. Can we do that? Oh, say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Ancient of days. Ancient of days. By the blood of Yeshua Jesus. By the blood of Yeshua Jesus. I by faith. I by faith. Step into the ancient of days court. Step into the ancient of days court. Where all ancient things are judged. Where all ancient things are judged. And altars. And altars. Are ancient pathways. And ancient pathways. So Father. So Father. I come before the Supreme Court of Heaven. I come before the Supreme Court of Heaven. Seeking justice. Seeking justice. From you Lord. From you Lord. And legal protection. And legal protection. From the evil altars. From the evil altars. Of my father's house. Of my father's house. And my mother's house. And my mother's house even external evil altars external evil altars of men and women who are jealous of my destiny and who are jealous of my destiny who want to see me fail who want to see me fail lord lord i do not care i do not care where the altars are coming from where the altars are coming from I come before the Supreme Court of Heaven. I come before the Supreme Court of Heaven. Knowing that altars, knowing that altars can be judged, will be judged and arrested and arrested and destroyed and destroyed in the courts of heaven. In the courts of heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank Heavenly you Father, that I am that I'm standing in your courtroom. As I stand in your courtroom. I acknowledge Yeshua. I have now just, as my advocate as my advocate in the courts of heaven in the courts of heaven according to first John according to first John chapter 2 chapter 2 where the Bible says where the Bible says we have an advocate we have an advocate an attorney an attorney in heaven in heaven the man Christ Jesus the man Christ Jesus Lord Jesus Lord Jesus I thank you I thank you for your advocacy for your advocacy on my behalf on my behalf concerning the destruction because of the, the destruction of the following evil altars following evil artists that I now subpoena that I subpoena to appear to appear in the courts of heaven in the courts of heaven now mention the altars by the cycle if it's poverty if it's frustration if it's anger if it's depression if it's barrenness mention whatever the altar is if it's witchcraft whatever is pervasive in your life, in your family maybe it's premature death everybody dies it dies young bring that altar in the court of heaven right now maybe it is demonic dreams I have had women who have who have told me that sexual dreams are, are, are a thing of the past. They used to be raped by spirits. They wake up raped. They, they hated it. Couldn't stop it. We went in the court of heaven and that's the last time those demonic beings would come in their dreams and have sex with them. All kinds of things. They are different type of altars. You know them by their ritual. You've been suffering them. Subpoena them. You are before your God. You are before your, the righteous judge. He has longed for this day. He has longed for you to come into this revelation. Okay, now say, Heavenly Father, righteous judge, now that I've subpoenaed these altars that I've mentioned by name before the court of heaven, Heavenly Father, I, I chose to repent for any, anything I have in common with these ever altars that I've been giving the devil legal rights to use these altars as springboards to attack my life and destiny. 
Heavenly Father, I repent on behalf of any member of my bloodline, known to me or unknown to me, who opened the door to the, our bloodline by coming into agreement with Satan, either for money or for power, but leveraged our bloodline in the transaction. I repent as an intercessor on their behalf. And I'm asking that by the law of proxy, the just for the unjust, I'm asking, Lord, that that the scene of this ancestor, that the scene of these members of, members of my bloodline be forgiven today through my repentance by the blood of Jesus. Let the blood of Jesus rise and cleanse me and my bloodline from every legal right we gave to these evil altars and the demonic spirits that operate behind these altars. In Jesus' name I ask, Lord, I thank you now that every legal right that these altars had to operate against my life and destiny, against my physical health, against my finances, is now revoked by the Supreme Court of Heaven, by the Ancient of Days. Lord, it is written in Daniel chapter 7 that the dominion of the Antichrist was removed when the court in heaven sat down and rendered the judgment against the Antichrist and his dominion was removed. I am asking that the Supreme Court of Heaven who now render, a, who now render judgments against each altar that are brought before the court of heaven, that their authority, their dominion over my life would now be removed in the name of Yeshua, the son of the living God. Heavenly Father, I now ask that you now release angelic officers of the courts of heaven, like Michael the archangel, to destroy all these evil altars, split them apart, let their ashes that represent all the sacrifices that were ever given to these altars to make them strong. Let those ashes be poured out. That means, Lord, these altars will never be used again against me destroyed today by the court of heaven in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Lord I thank you and because of my destiny because of what is written in my book of destiny this this verdict of release from these evil altars is secure in Jesus name I receive it by faith that from today, the cycles I was going through because of these evil altars, tonight at Prophesy Conference, it comes to an end. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy and let it be part of my testimony in the court of heaven and that I prophesy that from today, I will now be bound to the cycles of righteous altars in the name of Jesus wherever I go favor will be my portion breakthrough will be my portion increase will be my portion righteousness will be my portion because these are the cycles of the altars of the kingdom and I receive them now by faith in Jesus name Lord before I step out of the court of heaven I now ask for a divine restraining order to be now put in place against any members of my family who would like to resurrect these altars. Anybody in my family who tries to resurrect the altars that have been judged tonight by the court of heaven will be restrained 
by the living God. Because these altars, these altars that have terrorized me and my family will never rise again in Jesus' name. And Lord, any altar that is responsible for my health failing for any disease in my body, I say now, I will receive my healing. I receive my healing as the altars are judged. I'm getting healed right now by the power of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Give God a shout right now in the name of Jesus. One more shout, one more shout. One more shout. One more shout. One more shout. Now anybody that will raise your hand for healing, touch your body, put one hand on your body, the other hand to God, and I'm going to pray a prayer of healing right now. To close out the night, talk to me somebody. But here's what I want from you, talk to me somebody. Amen, you need to give your testimonies of healing by tomorrow. Amen, come on somebody. Hallelujah, touch, your, touch one part of your body, lift the other hand to God, because healing is happening. Man of God, I feel healing right now. Right now, stand in the office of a healing evangelist. I you gave him in 1989 when you appeared to me in my bedroom in Africa. Lord, right now, Father, I command every spirit of infirmity, every tumor, every pain, every cancer spirit, everything in the body of your sons and daughters that is not of God, I command the spirit of infirmity. I say, be gone in the name of Jesus. Be gone in the name of Jesus. I command creative miracles. I command creative miracles. Somebody with a broken... So so uh, there are several people problem with the back. Vertebrates. You can hardly bend without pain. God is healing you right now. In the name of Jesus. Ulcers. Somebody with ulcers is being healed right now. In the name of the Lord. Somebody with serious migraines. You got through serious migraines. God is healing you. God says you never have the migraines migraine again in the name of Jesus Christ there's somebody with a serious case of insomnia yes insomnia you can hardly go to sleep God is healing you from the insomnia right now in the name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus father thank you Jesus thank you Lord for the healing anointing thank you Lord for the healing Lord